right, Cindy Taylor is going to come and sing for us. They're supposed to be turning this one off. Hopefully they found it. And if you'll remember to turn it back on for Brother Booth, he'll, he'll appreciate having a little air here. And uh, Miss Taylor's going to sing, then Brother Booth will bring the message tonight. Thank you, sister. I appreciate that good music. Good to see you tonight on a Tuesday night. Appreciate you being here. I have enjoyed my week so far, and I, uh, I've had some wonderful meals over at Pastor's house. And uh, tonight, the food was excellent. Uh, the decorations were not much appreciated. I, uh, I mean, you would usually have a guest over and try to make them feel comfortable and be kind, but... No, I go over there, and the table has a table spread that has Ohio State. And every plate said Ohio State. And the tumbler I drank from said Ohio State. My I still have an upset stomach. 
so if I don't preach well tonight, you know why. They, those, those who get, live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <laughs> Thank you, brother. God bless your heart. Oh, it's good to see you tonight. I appreciate you being here. And, and uh, just one more night, and then uh, this part of the meeting's over. I'm looking forward to Thursday night, preaching in the prison, and, and uh, looking forward to Friday night, preaching to the RU group. And, man, it's just a great privilege to be able to stand up and tell people what the Word of God says. And, uh, you know, it is the truth that sets us free. We've gotten in a mentality today where we almost think that it's... Uh, entertainment that sets us free it's not entertainment that sets you free it's the truth that's why you've got to the word of God is what gets in the heart of people that's what changes people the power is in the word of God and uh, so it's just a privilege to be able to preach the word of God to be here this week and I appreciate uh, all that brother Slayball has done to make my stay comfortable except for tonight's dinner and uh other than that, it's been wonderful. I've enjoyed the fellowship. As a preacher, uh, it is encouraging to have preacher friends that just stand for the truth. And I appreciate your pastor. You ought to thank God every single day of your life for the pastor that God's put here. And I mean that sincerely. And uh, you travel with me a little bit. You'd thank God for what you have here, trust me. And uh, I've, I'm very grateful. There are major-sized cities in this nation that you can't find a church like this kind of church. And, uh, and I'm not exaggerating at all. And uh, so thank God for you. Thank God for the church. I, I love the church. I grew up, my dad being a preacher, and my dad went through a lot, pastoring. I saw him go through some real heartache and, and literally a nervous breakdown. And, and uh, I saw a lot of the pressure that came on my dad uh, in the ministry and, and challenges and difficulties and and I think through all that, like we talked about some last night, you know, God makes no mistakes. And through all of that, I think God helped prepare me for the burden that I have for the local church. I've never had a, an interest in preaching citywide meetings. Uh, I, I'm, I, I never have had an interest in, uh, honestly, I, I'm not a conference preacher. I, once in a great while I preach in a conference, but that's not really my burden. My burden is to help a local church. And uh, I love God's church. And I think if we can get our churches to where God could bless us, we could see revival in this country. And there is an enemy to the local church that I have seen over and over again that sometimes we just kind of overlook. And I want to deal with that tonight. So I, I decided tonight to preach on the meanest member of this church. Some of you are getting a little nervous. <laughs> Pastor has given me a list of names. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just joking. I'm joking that he gave me a list of names, but I'm going to preach on the meanest member of this church because this member has done more to destroy more churches than just about any other thing you can put your finger on. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If we could practice that, we'd see revival. And verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. I want to tell you, folks, we're kidding ourselves about revival. If we think we can have revival, if the Spirit of God is grieved. Do you know that you cannot have God's favor in your home if the Spirit of God is grieved? And here the Bible says and warns us, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You see, it is the Spirit of God that is the agent for revival. It is the Spirit of God that, that breathes power upon our efforts. It is the Spirit of God that we constantly, daily, every second of every day, need His fullness and His help. And the Bible here warns us about grieving the Spirit of God. And he says up there in verse 29, 
Uh, don't let any, any uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to go over to Proverbs chapter 10. And look at verse 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. Go to Psalm 39. And verse 1. It says, I said I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. And then go with me, if you would, to James chapter 3. And here I will name the meanest member in this church. It's named in Scripture. James chapter 3 and verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. We, but behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be uh, so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the, the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And so here it names the meanest member in this church and every church I've ever preached in. And that member is called a little member, but it has great, great damage that can be done with it, and that's the tongue. The tongue. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God can be grieved by the use of the tongue. And tonight, I want you to understand that this member was in my dad's church and just about, literally, tore his heart out. It's ruined more churches than alcohol. It's ruined more churches than immorality. It's ruined more churches than tobacco. It's ruined more marriages, more lives, more friendships. And yet it's an essential member. But I want us tonight to consider what the Word of God warns us about in this matter of the tongue. It can absolutely keep a church from having real revival. A pastor went to a, a dentist. While the dentist was looking inside his mouth, he said, you've got a small tumor on the back of your tongue that preacher said please don't do anything to mess up my tongue that's my life and there's more truth to that than you think it really is you see the tongue is a revealer of what's in the heart we take it lightly but God doesn't take it lightly look over at Matthew chapter 12 Let me preface the message tonight by saying, your pastor did not ask me to preach on this. He not, did not tell me that there's any issues going on in the church. He didn't tell me about anybody saying things they shouldn't be saying. Now, his wife did, but not the pastor did. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. 
For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. What's he saying? He's saying that what, what comes out of our, the words that come out of our mouth reveals the condition of our heart. It either justifies when we say that we love the Lord by what, what comes out of our mouth justifies the condition of a spiritual heart or it condemns in the eyes of others that what comes out of our mouth is not from a spiritual heart. You see, your words are a judgment for you or against you because it shows that condition of the heart. Someone said a third of life is spent talking. There was a restaurant owner that put a picture of an unpopular governor in the uh, front window of his restaurant. The governor's picture was him with his mouth wide open. And the, 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 uh, the letters under it said, open 24 hours a day. <laughs> they say that women speak 30,000 words a day and men 10,000 words a day. Some women have gusts up to 60,000 words a day. A doctor says, when you go to see him, let me see your tongue. And I'm not so sure that a preacher shouldn't say the same. Let's see how your tongue has been this week. And it reveals a lot about us. You know, after Adam sinned, his first conversation was to slander God. First thing he did, the woman thou gavest me, Lord. And James gives us a book on the character of living faith. And in it, we see our reaction to trials, temptations, truth, treatment of, of those who are unfortunate, and now the use of the tongue. And it's mentioned in chapter 1, it's mentioned in chapter 2, it's mentioned in chapter 4, and it's mentioned in chapter 5, and one whole chapter out of five is given just to the matter of the tongue because it reveals so much of the character of whether we really have living faith or not. So go back to Genesis with me, if you or I'm sorry, James with me, if you would. And let's see what the Scripture says about this tongue tonight. First of all, we see in James 3 and verse 1, the great potential to condemn. And it says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. It says, be not many masters. What does that mean? The word masters were teachers. Those who were expert in a subject. And the scripture says, don't be a know-it-all. Don't be the expert in every subject. You ever meet those kind of folks? It doesn't matter what story you tell, they got a bigger one to top it. You know, they've, they've always got to be the preeminent one. They've always got to get the most notoriety. It's all, you know... All glory goes to be. <laughs> and the Bible says, don't use your tongue to be uh, many masters, that, that you act like you know everything. You see, because your words give evidence about you, you've got to be careful. It'll tell on you. John Knox, the great uh, preacher of Scotland who saw revival break out in Scotland, John Knox, the first time he ever preached, felt such an overwhelming sense of responsibility he was so consumed that he was getting up and speaking on behalf of the Lord and supposed to be giving the truths of God's Word he was so felt the responsibility and weight of that that when he stood up to preach the very first time he began to sob and he couldn't get control of his emotions and they had to usher him off of the platform because he knew the great responsibility that we have before God of the words that come out of our mouth. Somebody said, remember your tongue is in a wet place and it can slip very easily. Our Lord and Savior, they said of him, never a man spake as he spake. Potential to condemn. But I want you to also see the great potential to control. This is an amazing passage, it says in verse 2, for if in many things we offend all, but if any, if any man offend not in word, 
the same as a perfect man, or he's reached his potential, or he's, he's completed, he's, he's got the fullness of God. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us. We turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they're turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so, the tongue's a little member and boasteth great things. So there's potential to control. He uses the illustration of that beautiful, big old, massive creation God made called a horse. That big old muscular horse that is so powerful, when, he is, when, when there's a bit in his mouth, and that, when that bit is broken and the pressure on that tongue controls the rest of his body. He uses, that, he uses the illustration of a ship. And man, some of these ships they have today, aren't they remarkable? I mean, it's a city floating on water. And yet just a small little helm that can turn that big, massive, ship it has great potential your tongue great potential for good or great potential for evil but if you can get control of it you can control the rest of your body the scripture says so where should our focus be i mean i'm for preaching against smoking i'm for preaching against drinking i'm for preaching against uh, dancing i'm for preaching against immorality and all add anything to the list that you can think of. But I want to tell you, the scripture says the tongue does more to damage than all those things put together. I have been in some tremendous churches where the pastor has a great burden, has a great walk with God and preaches with power and Man, God begins to do great things in the church and the church begins to, to increase and souls are getting saved. And I've seen it all absolutely explode because of Christians running their mouth. The tongue, it has such power for good or for evil. One lady told her pastor, she felt so guilty about her gossip, she wanted to lay her tongue on the altar. And he said, ma'am, there's not room. <laughs> I remember a dear lady we had in the church where I pastored in Louisiana. I mean, she was, she was a good-hearted lady. And, and I mean, but if you wanted to know any news on anybody, just call her. And you know, there's a lot of Baptists that way. They're on the internet all the time. And I, you know, sometimes, preacher... It's probably not kind, but I just want to say, do you have a life? How do you know everything about everybody? I don't want to know everything about everybody. Amen. But some people, they gather all. They're the Baptist news agency. Somebody put on a tombstone in a churchyard in England, and it said, beneath this stone, a lump of clay lies Arabella Young, who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. Some of you have to think about that. She's dead. You get it? She began to hold her tongue. Man, y'all are slow tonight. You are slow. Look at Proverbs 16 with me. Verse 24. These are great verses to memorize. Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. Go to Proverbs 31. Here's what it says about that virtuous woman. Verse 26, she openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue she cuts her husband apart and her children. It's not what it says, does it? It says, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Verse 7. Notice 
these things that the Lord said should not be part of our character as a Christian, notice how many of it relates to the tongue. He says, in the which ye also walked in some time when you lived in them, otherwise before you got saved in your old past, in your flesh, he said, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. We are to speak as Christians words of grace, words that minister grace, words that edify, words that bless, words that encourage, words that comfort, words that help. Can I ask you tonight, is that the testimony of your tongue in your home? Is that how your tongue is used towards your spouse? Is that how your tongue is used towards another member of the church? You see, the condition of your heart comes out with that tongue. And it tells so much. You got a dirty mouth? Guess what? You got a dirty, tongue, uh, you got a dirty heart. You got a, a hurtful, vicious tongue? You got a, an angry, bitter heart? It reveals. And if we can get the control of our tongue, it says you can control the whole body. Now I want you to see in verse 5 and 6 of James chapter 3, the potential of this tongue to corrupt. You see, it affects every part of our testimony, what comes out of our tongue. Chapter 3 of James in verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Notice this, behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on, the, on fire of hell. It says it defiles every other. You may go to the right places. You may dress the right way. You may, uh, you may carry your Bible. I mean, you may make sure that you're in church every day, but your tongue can destroy all of your testimony. I'm convinced that we have many young people today that are going through Christian schools, they're in, in, in homes that have them in, in, in camps, and they got them in conferences and all these things, and, and, and they sacrifice to make sure that their kids are always getting good preaching and all of that. And then when they get to be 18, they hit the world. You ever wonder why? And I'm convinced, not always, but many times, Many times it's because at home they hear so much bickering and fighting and fussing and, and calling of names and tearing down each other that they say, good night. If this is what all this Christianity produces, I don't want it. And that tongue does much to destroy. And the Bible says the Spirit of God is grieved. When our tongue is used in such a way. In Psalm 52 and verse 2 it says, Thy tongue de deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Look at Proverbs 16. Verse 27. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a burning fire. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisper separateth chief friends. James used the illustration, set on fire of hell. It's a strong, strong picture. You see, in Josiah's reign in the Old Testament, he had to put an end to the terrible practice of, of worshiping Molech. And in the worship of Molech, they would sacrifice children on an altar of fire in the valley of Gehenna. And when they would offer those children their little bodies 
in the valley of Gehenna on that altar would burn. And those parts of the body that didn't burn right away, would limbs and all would fall off into the debris in the valley of Gehenna. And the worms and the maggots would feast on them. And the stench was unbearable. And I don't say that to be crude tonight. I'm trying to help you to see the illustration he's using to these Hebrews that knew their history, to these Jews that knew their history. They understood exactly what he was saying, that the tongue and its destruction is as pathetically pitiful and wicked as the valley of Gehenna set on fire of hell. It's a system of iniquity. It defiles all that's not destroyed. It stains everything you do. It affects all that you touch. It's habitually fueled by hell. You say, well, I just, one of those that just speak my mind. Well, stop it. If you're going to grow up as a Christian, be a mature Christian, then you're not supposed to just say whatever comes to mind. You're supposed to filter that by the Holy Spirit of God. And the truth is, you don't mean that anyway. You don't just speak your mind all the time. People say that, they don't really mean that. Just get honest, men. When your wife comes home from the hairdresser, and it looks like her hair just come out of a steel wool explosion, and she says, how do you like it? You don't speak your mind. <laughs> well, honey, it's certainly... It's certainly different. You don't always speak your mind. You speak your mind when you want to say what you want to say. When you think you're just going to get something off your chest. But that's not what a Christian's supposed to do. You've got to be careful about speaking your mind. You'll get in big trouble. You might have heard about that guy that went in. Uh, he worked in a produce department at the grocery store. And a lady came in. She said, I'd like half of a lettuce there. He said, ma'am, we don't sell a half a head of lettuce. He said, we just sell them by the whole head of lettuce. She said, well, I just want a half a head of lettuce. I've been shopping in here for 20 years. You can't give me a half a head of lettuce? He said, just a minute. He goes over to his manager, and he says to his manager, there's some lame-brained woman that wants a half a head of lettuce. He didn't know she had followed him. And his manager's kind of giving him the... And suddenly he realized she was behind him and he said, and this dear lady, she wants the other half. <laughs> His manager said, man, that was quick thinking. Where'd you learn that? Oh, he said, listen, you know, I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And in Grand Rapids, Michigan, he said, they are known for their, their great hockey players and for their ugly women. And his manager said, excuse me, my wife grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He said, and what hockey team did she play on? <laughs> You've got to be careful saying what's on your mind. You can get yourself in deep, deep trouble. You heard the story about the man who got pulled over. He was driving 95 miles an hour. Policeman pulls him over, and he walks up, and he's writing a ticket. And... Uh, he said, sir, I clocked you at 95, and the, the man said, well, you're mistaken. Your radar must be off. It hadn't been calibrated lately because um, I, I wasn't going that fast. And uh, he said, I had the thing on cruise control the whole way. His wife's sitting there. She said, honey, we don't even have cruise control. <laughs> Officer begins to write another ticket. He said, uh, his wife is sitting over there, and she said, by the way, honey, you ought to just be glad that you're your um, speed detector went off or we'd have been in bigger trouble. <laughs> He's starting to write another ticket. <laughs> Officer says, well, I know you weren't wearing a seatbelt. He said, well, I took it off when I pulled over. His wife said, oh, come on, honey, you know you never wear a seatbelt. <laughs> He's writing another ticket. He just blows up. He starts hollering and calling her names and cussing and swearing. And the officer said to the dear lady, ma'am, does he always talk to you this way? She said, no, no only when he's drunk. You just can't always say what's on your mind, amen. It'll get you in trouble every time. 
That tongue can be a blessing. It can bring a curse. Look at verse 7. The great potential for combat, it says, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. You say, well, if no man can tame it, then what's the use? Because only the Spirit of God can tame it. And that's what he's telling us. As a Christian, we're to be yielded to the Spirit of God in every part of us. And this tongue that can be used to spread the gospel, this tongue that can be used to uplift and encourage, this tongue that can be used to edify and minister grace, if it's under the flesh, it's going to be used. For evil, and for conflict, and combat. We see it every time there's a political race, don't we? I've seen many great preachers come under attack from the tongue. And carnal people just like to believe it. Haman spread a lie about Mordecai. The liars came and to Zedekiah and had Jeremiah thrown in jail. The Pharisees lied about Jesus. It's always been that way. And can I tell you tonight, all of us struggle with that tone. So we could take our Baptist halos tonight off and be honest. We all battle with that tone. We have to be careful. But it gives a conflicting testimony to those who believe or we've told that we're saved and love Jesus, it'll give a conflicting testimony if it's not kept under the control of the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, you can't have revival in your church and you can't have a continued blessing of the Spirit of God in your church or in your home or in your personal life if you don't get that tongue yielded to the Spirit of God. Now I'm asking you tonight, not what I know, because I don't know, but what does God know about the use of your tongue? Most often, it's revealed in our homes. Most often, it's revealed between husband and wife. Or between children and parents. But usually, it'll carry over. And it begins to affect and infect our churches. And across this country, I have seen it over and over again. My daddy had a great heart for the Lord. My daddy was a man's man. He's a Marine Corps hero in World War II. He boxed. He played college football. He was a man's man. But my dad loved God with all of his heart, and he loved people. And in his church, it wasn't that anybody could point to anything immoral or anything unethical or anything doctrinally incorrect. Oh, you know what began to eat away at his heart? Because he had a group of critics that pick apart every little decision that he made. Every Well, I don't think we should have changed Sunday school classrooms around like that. I don't think you should have got him books that you got. I don't, you know, all these things that won't matter a hill of beans when we stand before the Lord. But it was just constant, 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 constant. And the church could not move forward. I want to tell you something. I played enough team sports in my life to know our coach used to tell us in basketball, if you can get them fussing and fighting between each other, we'll win the game. Say, well, that's not a very nice way to play. But that's what, I didn't go to a Christian school. And that's what he'd tell us. And you know, the devil knows that. He knows if he can get Christians and church members fussing and fighting and talking about one another and, oh, you know, so-and-so, you know what she said, and, you know, I don't like the way she, de she deals with her children, and I don't like this, and, you know, I, man, uh, the, I don't like the way that the youth worker, he, he dealt with my children like this, and I don't like that. And, 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 man, we fuss and fight about the most foolish things. And the Spirit of God is grieved. The Pharisees would say 18 prayers a day. Or 18 prayers, excuse me, three times a day. And then they'd get off of their knees and they'd pick apart everybody around them. 
We got a bunch of Pharisees sitting in independent Baptist pews today. It's amazing how we think that we know better than everybody. Be not many masters. You know what that means? If you haven't pastored a church, you sure aren't in the position to tell a pastor how to pastor a church. And even if you have and you're not currently, then evidently God didn't want you to pastor this church or he'd put you there. But our tongues are so hard to get under control unless we yield them to the Spirit of God. In fact, they're impossible to get under control. It's natural. Our old flesh is that way. I'm telling you, as a booth, it is in my genetics to be a smart aleck. Don't say amen, preacher. It just comes to me. i got to watch it all the time. I'll pop off before I realize it. I just got to watch it. When we started football camp 24 years ago, and I want to tell you something, God, God has been good to us. Brother Woodward and I have worked hand in hand for 24 years. And, and people, other preachers say, man, how in the world have you guys done this for 24 years without fighting and fussing? Because it's not about us. You know, we want the Lord to work and, and bless, and, and we understand that. It's not about us. But, you know, I remember in the early years when we st first started the camp, and, uh, man, we are trying to get equipment, and everything was costing, you know, and we were, we were going an average of ten to $15,000 a year in the hole by the end of camp. Brother Woodward's daddy is just a tremendous guy. He's in heaven now. His name was Leroy. Leroy drove truck. He, he had a, 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 a small farm as well. Hard-working guy, big old guy, tough as nails. He used to tell me, he said, you know, Brother Booth, he said, my nickname was Stonewall. <laughs> he said, because when they run into me, they said it like a stone wall. He said, I love that body contact. He's just a tough guy. And he drove truck, and, and, and Brother Woodward's daddy loved the Lord, but he never got his language totally sanctified. Y'all figure that out after a bit. And he was just rough. And I never had met him when we started football camp. Dan would tell me, oh, someday you've got to meet my mom and dad. He said, you know, they, they picked up the bill for what we call our drag-up bills last year. Dad wrote out a check. said, how much was it, Dan? About $10,000 in the hole. He wrote out a check for $10,000, paid him. He did this for the first couple of years. I knew about that, but I'd never met him. He was living in Wisconsin, our camps in, in Illinois. I'd never met him. And so about the fourth year or so, or third year, we, we had some bleachers set up on the sidelines, and, and parents don't usually come until the end of the week. On Friday, we have the big final games and all that. And, and so we had some parents there sitting in the, and, you know, by Friday, we're all tired, and we're all on edge. And, and we have it set up where Brother Woodward, there's two game, or two game fields, and we've got four teams playing two games at one time. And Brother Woodward takes one field, and I take one field, and we just kind of supervise and make sure that there's no major problems going on. And so we walk up and down the sideline. Just, he carries a, a, a radio, you know, and I carry one, and that way we can communicate to each other if there's something that we need. And so he's walking down on this field over here. I'm walking down the sideline of this field over here. There's an old guy in the stand who yells out and says, Your coaches are a bunch of whining babies. I turned around and I said, Excuse me? He said, Your coaches are a bunch of whining babies. I said, uh, My coaches are not a bunch of whining babies. Oh, I guess I'm lying. I said, Thanks for admitting it. I just turned around, walked on down. At halftime, we switched fields. I'm over at this field. Brother Woodward's over on this field. He's standing next to those bleachers. He gets on the radio. He says, hey, Booth. I said, what? He said, look over here. I looked over there. He's standing next to that old guy. He said, I see you met my dad. <laughs> I'm telling you, honestly, he didn't speak to me for two years. Finally, we became very, very close, and he asked me to preach at his funeral. But I just popped off. It just, that's, that's just natural in me. And you know what? 
If I don't stay yielded to the Spirit of God, it comes out. And every one of us battle it. And for the health of our church and our families, we need to admit the problem and say, Dear God, take control of this tongue because I can't control it. Help me to be yielded to Thee. Lord, have Your way. Help me to say things that are ministering grace and edifying to my spouse, to my children. I understand you've got to scold. I understand that you've got to deal with discipline. I understand that. But it should never be out of control. The Lord disciplines me, but it can get out of control. The tongue, the meanest member. A young lady said to her parents, she was at a, a camp, youth camp. At that youth camp, they were asking for testimonies of the teenagers. A young lady said, I'd like to share a testimony. She stood in front of those teenagers and she said, um, she said, just this year, I was getting ready to leave in the morning. I got my books and everything ready to go to school and catch the bus and she said, I, I told my mom and dad, hey, I'm going to go after school to so-and-so's house. And they said, no, you're not going to so-and-so's house. You know we don't approve of them. We don't approve of the way they live. You're not going there. She said, well, I am going there. They said, no, you're not going there. She threw a fit, threw her books, screamed, cussed, grabbed everything together, before she walked out the door and slammed it, she said, I hope you die. Wham. Shut the door. She told the story to the teenagers. She said, I'm at school that morning. She began to sob. She said, the principal came to my classroom and said, I need to talk with you. She thought, I thought that was real strange, so I went with the principal to his office when I got there, there were two policemen there. And they said, young lady, we're very sorry to let you know this. But shortly after you went to school this morning, somebody broke into your house. And with a hatchet, they murdered your mom and daddy and they're gone. She said to those teenagers, I wish to God I could take those words back. I wish to God I had another chance to tell my mom and dad that I really love them. I wish to God I would never have said that. It haunts me. And that tongue can be full of deadly poison if we don't keep it yielded to the Spirit of God. There may be somebody you need to apologize to. There may be a spouse if you really want revival, Bible Baptist Church, you're going to have to yield to the Spirit of God where He's got control of that tongue because the Spirit is grieved when the words that come out don't edify and minister grace. The meanest member in this church and every church I preach in is that little member we call the tongue. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this time we've had to look at the Word of God tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be tender enough, Lord, and humble enough to admit where you're speaking to our heart about. I don't know any problem in this church, Lord. I don't know anybody that has a, a, it's caused grief or heartache because of it, but you do. And so I'm asking you tonight, would you help us tonight? Would you give some real breakthrough? And would you give some real victories? And may it even make a difference in some marriages and in some homes and relationship with other family members, relationship in the church family. May we be spirit-filled and spirit-controlled. What an amazing church when its members are speaking words of grace and edification. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody looking. I want to ask if there's anybody here tonight that would say, be honest with you, Brother Booth, I've been struggling about whether I'm truly saved or not. 
I sure don't want to go to hell, but I, I'm, I can't say that I'm 100% sure I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure I'm saved. But I'd like that to be settled. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that tonight? I wonder who tonight would say, Brother Booth, I'm saved on my way to heaven. And I needed that tonight. As a Christian, the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart tonight. And I needed that. Some things I need to get settled with the Lord. Pray for me. Would you slip your hands up? God spoke to your heart tonight. God bless you. Thank God for you. Thank God for tender hearts. Many, many hands raised. Maybe there's others. Maybe something I didn't mention specifically tonight, but the Holy Spirit mentioned to you tonight. Yeah, Brother Booth, include me in the prayer. I didn't raise my hand before. I am raising it now. Include me. God's dealing with me about some things as well. Something that maybe you didn't even preach about, but the Lord's speaking to my heart about that I need to get settled with him. Include me in the prayer. Slip your hand up. Anybody else? God bless you. Several others. Thank you. In just a moment, we're going to stand for prayer. It's revival meeting time. It's time we just get thoroughly honest with the Lord. And when Brother Bob sings tonight, God spoke to your heart. You raised your hand, or if you didn't, but God's dealing with you. Let's come and find a place at the altar. Let's be honest with him. Let's ask him for the grace to help and yield ourselves to the Spirit of God and that God would make us aware and help us to be careful and that he just bring a renewed spirit in our homes and a renewed spirit in our church and that God could do what he wants to do. And that our tongues would be used as a blessing and a spreading of the gospel, words of kindness. Let's stand for prayer. Father, again, we love you. Thank you tonight, Lord, for speaking to hearts once again. Thank you for tender hearts. A number of hands raised, Lord, and I pray you'd help us tonight. Maybe some husbands and wives need to ask for forgiveness and get some things right between them. Maybe there's some church members that have said things that have hurt somebody that they need to apologize and get things right. Would you just help us tonight, please, Lord, to obey Thee. Many hands that were raised give victories, we pray. Bless this invitation time now. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Some music plays. God spoke to your heart. You need to come. You come right now, would you? Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my hands and let them move. Could it be that the, the Spirit of God is grieved of thy love with your tongue? At the impulse of thy love. There may be some young people that need to come to the altars. Take my lips Words to their and mom and dad have not been be wholesome. Filled with messages the Spirit of God. for Thee. Take my silver there may be some that the old devil has given that critical gold, spirit that you just like to pick apart things. I Why don't you yield to the Spirit of God tonight and ask Him to forgive you for that? Would I Others need to come, you come. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Always only for my King Take my love, my God, I pour At Thy feet its treasure store Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. 
look this way for a minute if you would good message tonight wow it's always <clears throat> it's always a challenge to us when it's the subject of the tongue is it not uh, he's right that's something all of us have to be careful of and watch so easy to 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 be in the flesh and to, to say things we don't need to say and um, you know I was thinking about Barnabas you know the the son of consolation which means the, the son of encouragement when when the people got saved down in Antioch the people the church the apostles who were still in Jerusalem tried to decide who should we send down there and they said well let's send Barnabas down there and he encouraged them and then when he left there to find Saul he brought him back to Antioch and they stayed there and encouraged those people and they were called Christians first in Antioch largely because of Barnabas and the teaching of Barnabas and Saul. And uh, he was just encouraging. Uh, when that early church in Jerusalem, when they, when they sold property, and remember Ananias and Sapphira lied about what they sold it, but where'd they get the idea about selling property and giving all the money to the church? You know who did that? Barnabas did that. He was just always an encouragement. And even, even after he and Saul, he and Paul had that disagreement about John Mark, you know, and they, they, they split up. He felt strongly about that. I don't believe he, he, well, we know he didn't go on a campaign against Paul. And he didn't criticize Paul to John Mark. And that had been easy to do. But he didn't do it because later on, John Mark, Paul said, bring John Mark. He's profitable for me for the ministry. I want him. Well, he'd have never wanted him if Barnabas had gone on a campaign to, to tear down Paul. Uh, he didn't do that. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I think, I think I want to be a Barnabas. I want to be be an encourager, and uh, let's let let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth. He said, but that which is good use of edifying, edify builds up. That means corrupt communication would tear somebody down. I read something this week that um, someone was asking a a preacher. Uh, about another situation in another church. He said, what, what do you think about this situation? He said, I don't think anything. He says, what do you mean you don't think anything? I know you got, come on, I know you got an opinion about it. What do you think you should do? He says, I don't, I don't, I don't have an opinion on it. He says, nothing to do with me. Had nothing to do with our situation. I don't have to have an opinion on it. Isn't that good? And you know, when, when it doesn't deal with you, he said, what do you think about so-and-so? What do you think they ought to do? You know what? I don't have to think anything. Doesn't have anything to do with me. In the, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. That means the more we say, the more opportunity we have to sin. And, uh, boy, it's such a value, it's such a virtue when we can learn to let your words be few. I think it's, there's a verse that says, God's in heaven and you're on the earth, therefore let your words be few. And uh, that's a great, great reminder for us tonight, Brother Booth. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Now. Got to ask the Lord to help us live those verses and not just talk about them. Not know them up here, but have them in our heart. So we'll live the Bible we learn. Amen? All right. I'm glad I came tonight. Hope you are too. Uh, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for each one. Made the way to the service tonight. Lord, I pray your blessing upon each individual. Thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank you for giving us the truth from your word. And I pray, Lord, we live the truth out in our life. Give us your help, Lord. And may the Spirit of God be in control. May we live under his control as we leave this place tonight. Not only in what we do, but by what we say. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 Let's sing the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. It's 128 in the book. If you need it. Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven and that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>